Okay, so today we're going to finish talking about some wave-like behavior of light. And so the first thing that we're going to talk about is resolution and the technical term is Rayleigh criterion. And so resolution is just how, how small of a detail or separation you can see. And so you you would have even seen this in the lab yesterday or when you go to get your eyes examined, you'll look at some chart that has a bunch of letters on it and there will come a certain point where you can't see, you can't distinguish the letters because they are too small. So uh, this physics that we're gonna talk about will help explain that. So first, uh, what we're going to be picturing here is, I guess, kind of similar to the slits we were talking about, but now, uh, so here's our light source. And it's going to go through some circular aperture And then there would be some screen on the other side of the aperture that the light would be uh, shining onto. And so the size of this aperture is large compared to the wavelength of the light. And so the pattern that we're going to see on the screen So this is your screen. So there's going to be some, maybe I'll do it in a different time. There'll be some bright central region. And then there's going to be kind of a dim band around that region. And then it's going to be not quite, not as bright as the center part, but certainly brighter than the that dim ring. And so, so maybe I'll wait. So the, the middle one is bright. Right, central region. And then you've got kind of a dim ring. And then you've got another region that's brighter than 
the dim ring. But not as bright as the as the central region. I'll just write that somewhere else. Okay, so um, another way to think about this is if you were to take the constructive and destructive interference pattern that we saw for the slit experiments and you rotated it to make it uh, like two dimensional instead of one dimensional, you would get something that looks like this. Uh, so maybe I'll do that on the next thing. So kind of in one dimension, we had maybe something that looks like this. And then if you rotate that in two dimensions, you get uh, what I was just talking about where this you have this bright central region. And then you've got you've got this region where it destructively interferes. And then you've got another bright region outside of that. And so this this is just matching up where these different points are uh, in the two-dimensional picture versus the one-dimensional picture. So any questions about this? Uh, so the, the reason that we're doing this when we're talking about resolution now is if we take two of these patterns so if we take one bright central region, one dimmer ring, and then another bright region out here. and we wanna do two of these, then obviously when they're spread out like this, it's easy to see that you have two separate objects. So now when I bring these two together, maybe I'll let you guys think about this for a couple minutes. How, how close could you get them before you start having trouble distinguishing that it's two separate objects? <laughs> 
maybe you could even draw it on your piece of paper when you think you would have trouble telling that it was two, two separate things. So if we take our bright regions, and we have them separated by their by their dim region around them, then we can definitely still see that they're two objects still. Uh, but then what if we can even get them closer and let's say that we have the two things touching like that and you can still pretty well tell that it's two separate things. But then when you start getting closer than that, how can you tell that that's two separate things and maybe not just one object that looks like that? So that is going to be the smallest or the closest that two things together are going to be. So, so this is the closest we can resolve. So that's why it's called resolution two objects. And here you can't tell if this is, is this two circles overlapping or one oddly shaped object or bean shaped or whatever that is. Okay. And so there's a formula for this separation distance and we measure the separation in terms of an angle and this is that formula, lambda over d. So this is a separation angle. This is the wavelength of the light. And this is the aperture diameter. And so the separation angle is measured in radians, not in degrees. And so now we're gonna use this equation to investigate some different scenarios like what's the resolution of a telescope, what's the resolution of a microscope, and then I'll also show you why we're limited in the sizes of things we can measure based on the size of the wavelength of the light that we're using to measure. So let's look at the resolution for a telescope, for example. So the Hubble telescope has, uh, so this is a space telescope. It has a 2.4 meter primary mirror, which is the same kind of idea as an aperture. And so it measures light 
in the optical wavelength, visible wavelengths. So let's just say kind of in the middle for 550 nanometers. So if we want to figure out the resolution of that telescope, we take this equation, multiply by the wavelength, divide by the aperture size, and you get two, well, I'll just call it 2.8 times 10 to the minus seven radians. And then you can convert that into degrees. Uh, 80 degrees pi. So when you do that, you still get a pretty small number of degrees. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus five degrees. So that's a very, very good resolution, uh, but I'll provide some context for that in a second. So now, so we've seen telescopes. Now, what about microscopes? So for a microscope, Uh, you're looking at maybe a 10 millimeter aperture, and you're still looking in the visible wavelength. So we'll just pick a nice number in the middle. And so when you do this calculation again, Now we're dividing by 10 times 10 to the minus three, you're gonna get not so good of a resolution. Six point seven times ten to the minus six radians. And then again, we can convert that to degrees by multiplying by 180 and dividing by pi. And so there you get 3.84 times 10 to the minus four degrees. So the microscope is about an order of magnitude, has an order of magnitude less resolution than a giant space telescope. So you might wonder why that's acceptable. Um, and so the reason is going to be that uh, you have to look at the scale of the things that these are measuring. So, uh, the equation that governs that. So if you just take a an angle, so we'll say theta, and you want to measure. So basically, what we've done is we've calculated the smallest uh, angle between two objects that we can measure. So if this was object one, and this was object two as long as the angle between them is bigger than those numbers that we just calculated, uh, you can distinguish those two objects. Now, uh, the scales of the things that we're measuring are gonna come into play here. So the 
physical distance between the two objects is S and the distance from the observer to the object is R. And so you can equate these things like this. So this is the separation distance of the two objects. This is the distance from the observer to the object or objects. And then theta is the angular separation. So even though the resolution of the telescope was better than the resolution of the microscope, because the distances in astronomy are so much bigger than the distances in microscopy, uh, microscopes are usually much better at looking at the things that they wanna look at than telescopes are. So uh, what we calculated was basically, so using this equation, this is basically the smallest separation angle we can measure. So if you wanted to use this uh, equation in the red box, if you knew the smallest separation angle and you knew how far away whatever you were observing is, then you would know how far apart you can place the objects and still be able to tell that it's two objects. Or if you knew how far apart two objects were and you knew the smallest separation angle, then you could use that to determine the distance away from you those two objects are. Uh, so that's the separation, but now uh, what if you're trying to design something uh, that either receives light or uh, and in different frequency ranges? So, So for example, we send information over radio waves. So if you're listening to a radio or if you have satellite TV, now the wavelength of the signal is going to determine how big of a receiver you need to build. So this is wavelength of signal and this is this would be the size of receiver or antenna so for example if a radio wave is one meter, and your receiver is also one meter, then the smallest angle that you could measure would be one over one. So you would get 1.22 radians. And then if we convert that to degrees, we would get 
60 degrees. About. Let's move that. More precise, I guess that would be more like 70 degrees. And so depending on the type of information that you're sending, that might not be a good enough resolution. And so you might need a bigger receiver so that you can basically receive more information or receive the information, uh, like more information per amount of radio wave that you're receiving. Uh, so then on the smaller side of things, uh, let's say that you wanted to measure something that was really, really small. So this is on the big side of things. On the small scale, You're kind of limited by the wavelength of your measurement. Uh, so for example, uh, if you wanted to look at something through a microscope, then you need to use visible wavelength light. Uh, so let's say that's 400 nanometers is what you can see. And there's also a, a limit to how small you can build your telescope, or not your telescope, your microscopes. So let's say that's one millimeter. So this is for visible wavelength. Smallest aperture microscope. Let's say that's one millimeter. I'm not sure what the actual number is, but we'll just use that for a calculation. So then you get a resolution of Zero point zero zero four nine radians. But what if the things that you need to measure have a smaller separation distance than that? Well, your microscopes can only get so small, the aperture. And so the only thing that we can really change in this equation is the wavelength. So if I make my wavelength smaller, then I would make my resolution smaller, which means I can see smaller details on things. The drawback to that is that I can only make my wavelength so small until I start making uh, types of light that's gonna be harmful to biological samples. So gamma radiation is the smallest wavelength of light, but so that would help you see the smallest resolution. But if I start firing gamma rays at something that's biological, it's gonna die. And so there are some techniques that you look at something for a split second until it no longer the same sample as what you started with, uh, but obviously that's not gonna work for something that you need to continue to live. And so you're kind of stuck at this limit of, we can only build our microscopes in such a way and any kind of wavelength of light that's too small will destroy our sample. And so we're kind of stuck. And so this is the limit for optical microscopes. There are 
other kinds of microscopes like uh, electron microscopes that do stuff with quantum mechanics, uh, but maybe that's something we can talk about later. But this is kind of the limit for optical microscopes. So now there's one more aspect of light acting like a wave that we want to talk about, and that's polarization. And so if you remember back to our description of light, it's electromagnetic waves. So you've got an electric field that's oscillating like this, and the wave is propagating this way. And then you've got a magnetic field that's oscillating, like it's going into the page, coming out of the page, and then going into the page. I'm not a very good 3D artist. So the red is coming into and out of page. And so that's how we, the electromagnetic part of the equation are these waves oscillating back and forth, and that's what light is. So polarization talks about the direction that the electric field is oscillating. So for example, I chose the electric field to be oscillating in the y direction, but it could have been all, uh, oscillating in the z direction into or out of the screen. And then the magnetic field would have been oscillating up and down. Or it could have been the electric field could have been oscillating in any angle between those two directions. And so polarization describes the angle that the electric field is oscillating with respect to some axis. So if we look at the So another way to to write this down is that, so let's say this is your photon. If the photon is traveling in, let's say it's coming out of the page, Then the elect the electric field could have been could be oscillating in any of the directions that I have these arrows drawn. And for unpolarized light, you can think of it as uh, a bunch of photons traveling together, and they are all oscillating in these random directions. And so the so unpolarized light is this picture here, where you have a bunch of photons traveling together and the angle of their polarization is pointing in all of these different directions. And so the light is unpolarized. What you can do is have all of those photons travel through a, a polarizer. And so the polarizer is kind of just a, 
a screen with a long, if it's a linear polarizer, it's just a long screen with a kind of slit in the middle of it. And you'll get this unpolarized light coming in where the electric fields are all oriented in random directions. You'll go through this polarizer and then on the other side, you'll have light that's only, that has electric fields that are only oscillating in one direction. And so this is called linearly polarized light. And so if you've if you've had like polarized sunglasses, this is the kind of principle that this works on. So uh, sunlight or ambient light that you see is usually unpolarized. And so I can reduce the intensity of the light by basically getting rid of all of the light that has randomly pointing electric fields and only let through the light that is polarized in this axis that I've chosen. And so that's what those sunglasses are doing is the sunglasses are a polarizer. They're only letting through a certain type of polarized light. And so that's dropping the intensity and letting you like be out on a bright day and not have to cover your eyes, for example. So uh, this has a lot of practical applications. And then uh, if you've also had sunglasses on and tried to look at a phone screen or a computer screen, you might find it hard to do. And that's because those screens are also polarized. And what happen, what can happen depending on the angles is your sunglasses are polarized one way and the screen is polarized in a different way. And those polarizations would cancel out and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So uh, in this picture, we have the polarizer. We have one polarizer. If you were to send unpolarized light through two polarizers that were oriented perpendicularly to each other, then you would get no light on this side. Because in the middle here, you would have selected this kind of polarized light but then when this polarized light interacts with the perpendicular polarizer, it basically just blocks all the light coming through. And then there's one more thing, or there's a couple more things about polarization. So the first is that um, different, indexes of refraction can cause polarization. So basically, if you have like some unpolarized light coming in and it enters some other index of refraction, then so incident refracted, you can get some polarized reflected light. And 
the equation that governs the angle of this uh, reflection will be where this angle is called Brewster's angle. And this is the angle at which light is completely polarized. And so we don't really have time and it's a little bit out of the scope of this class, but there's also a type of polarization called circular polarization. Um, where, so in linear polarization, the electric field is just oscillating up and down. For circular polarization, the electric field basically rotates as it moves forward. And so the electric field is still pointing in different directions all the time. So it's still quote unquote oscillating, uh, but it's uh, not oscillating in the same way that a linearly polarized light is. And so you can, uh, one of the examples of circular polarization is um, like 3D movie glasses. Uh, so some of those are circular, circularly polarized. And so, for example, if you try to wear linearly polarized sunglasses and look through a circularly polarized movie glasses, then those, again, will cancel out and you won't really be able to see anything. But that's just kind of an extra thing to be aware of that other kind, there's another kind of polarization that's not just um, linear polarization. 